Hi folks, Mike Shea from SlyFlourish.com and Twitter.com slash SlyFlourish. Here with another episode of Sly Flourish's Lazy DM Prep. This is a weekly show. No one's listening to me, are they? They're just looking at the cat over my shoulder. That's my new co-host. We have a new co-host here on the Sly Flourish Lazy DM Prep show. Uh, one who I'm sure will aid in all of our understanding and is going absolutely crazy in the little cat box behind me. Uh, that is Maliki. Maliki is our new uh, adopted cat. We have been fostering cats for a long time. And yesterday, we took the plunge and adopted a two-month-old kitten. And that is her there in the back. So you will be seeing her, uh, hopefully, for, I don't know, 16, 17 years. I'm not, I assume I'll be doing shows that long. So yes, uh, this is a weekly show in which I uh, go through the steps from Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master while preparing for my uh, D&D uh, Waterdeep Dragon Heist game. I am running Dragon Heist at my local friendly local game shop. And uh, I go through the steps from Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master uh, while preparing for that game and chat with folks about D&D. You can see the show live on Twitch right now uh, at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time on Sundays. Uh, or you can watch it at any time at your convenience on uh, YouTube. Uh, if you are not familiar with Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master or the eight steps from Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master, you can uh, look at the links below, both on Twitch and on YouTube, uh, in which you can watch videos that talk about the eight steps uh, from Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master, or uh, and it also links to a PDF where you can read all about those eight steps. You can also buy the book, which I, I sure wouldn't mind you, mind you doing. Uh, if you are on Twitch right now, please say hello in the chat, and uh, we can talk about all things D&D, &D, uh, while also uh, getting ready to prep for my game. Uh, oh, I'm getting texts. Let's see here. Uh, so, we're going to put that on silent, I think. No, that's all right. So, uh, where to begin? I don't know. I sure love that. She loves that little perch, doesn't she? Hello. Hello there. I had to move the perch because it was too far back, and she tore down my book background thing. She, she reached out and grabbed it and, and, and pulled it on down. So uh, I now moved it a little closer. I think that works better. You can tell she's very quiet and, and very, you know, subdued. Um, she's actually a wonderful cat. So one thing that I like, she, she, she has a really good time entertaining herself. She has, uh, in the day that we've had her, she's got a lot of toys in here and a lot of things going on. So she's a happy camper. Little, little gal. I think less than three pounds. Whoop, oh, there she goes. Whoop, where's she going? Nope. Um, let's see. So in my last session of Waterdeep Dragon Heist, we began, uh, let's see, that was chapter, uh, chapter four, Dragon Season. And as I talked about in the last uh, show, um, uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, jo Joaquin in Dead says, Adopted cat hangs out with me in a chair behind just like that. Congrats. Lots of happiness. Head. Yes, indeed. Yeah, we love we love our cats. Oh, where are you going now? What are you doing? Going into the hamper. Why are you going to the hamper? Oh, you're going to get stuck in there. We might have to do a cat rescue. We'll see. Yay, my mom is here. Hello, mom. We see you. Uh, I am enjoying my weekend thoroughly. Yes. Um... Yeah, so chapter four. Um, so chapter three, we have, I've talked about this in previous in, in previous episodes, that chapter three, chapter two, ugh, the, the, the chapters vacillate between being something that's pretty straightforward and being something kind of weird that we have to work with. And uh, chapter one and chapter three are both pretty straightforward. Chapter one is the whole quest to go rescue the Galt Neverember uh, and uh, Froon. I was getting Floon. Cat, what are you doing? Where are you going? Um, and, uh, hey, look at my crazy hair. Yeah. That's pretty boss right there. Uh, Floon. So you go and you have to rescue Floon. Um, and it's a nice, straightforward investigation and dungeon delve. And then you fight a nice boss and you get Floon. So it's a really good intro, I think. It's a strong intro. Again, my only real re recommendation for it is to... Um, uh, so, so, uh, Maliki is running around on the side, but I'm sure she'll be back on her perch before too long. Uh, she's still exploring this room. Um, 
So that's a nice straightforward level one, level two adventure. My only recommendation is leveling up to two early. So may maybe have like an interesting fight in um, uh, the Yawning Portal, level them up to two, and then they can do the rest of the investigation at level two. Uh, that's my own only real recommendation for that, for that chapter. Then chapter two is pretty bizarre. Chapter two uh, in, is, is, has sort of two main functions. One is... It's the way for the characters to build up their mansion, which is pretty cool. Although different groups are going to want to have different degrees of, of you know, detail in that. Some are just like, let's just throw money and talk about it. Other ones might be really interested in like who they hire and what those jobs are and, and integrating, you know, getting involved in all the politics. There's a whole lot of like bureaucratical red tape that you can get involved if, if you want. Um, and then the second part of chapter two is... Um, getting involved with the factions. And they offer up seven different factions, the, the core five factions, plus um, uh, Brigand D'Arth and um, uh, the Grey Hands. And each of those seven uh, factions have about five quests that they can give out. Power Score RPG is here. Wow, and Power Score's got a cool little d, d ampersand thing. I don't know what that is. It's pretty cool, though. It looks like a bomb with an ampersand on it. Uh, uh, power score is also writes probably, uh, let's see if we can find it here. Um, yes, power score writes the absolute best adventure guides that I have read. So if you are playing any of the published adventures, uh, I'm going to throw the link in the chat because power score probably won't, uh, PowerScore writes the best guides to published adventures that I have read. Uh, and whenever I write chapters about uh, the hardback adventure games, I almost always, right off the bat, include a link to, to PowerScore's guide because they are really detailed and really interesting. They're great cliff notes for adventure writing. I highly, highly recommend it. There's a website. And they are all available on the DMs Guild. So uh, let's take a look. Where's, oh, and, and, and they write uh, a lot of published adventures as well on the DMs Guild. Uh, I don't see a link to Dragon Heist. I'm sure there is. Power Score, would you link your link to the, I'm sure you have one for Waterdeep Dragon Heist, right? Uh, cool stuff. Uh-oh, Kitty's coming. So um, Dragon Heist is not up on the guild yet. Aha, yes, so, uh, but you have one, right? I think. I can, I can Google as good as anyone. Yay, look at that. Uh, I don't think I've looked at this one recently, so I probably should because I'm sure it's great and I'm sure you offer stuff, but you can also offer it in chat. Um, you hit a wall with Mad Mage. Yeah, I bet you did. <laughs> I don't know how you, I don't know how you do Mad Mage. Maybe, maybe just give that one a pass and stick to it, but I'm looking forward to your one for, uh, Salt Marsh. I'd like to see, hear about Salt Marsh. Uh, yeah, it's like 26 levels. I don't know. You, you know, you end up writing your own 300 page source book. Um, so, uh. So you have these 42 faction quests. So you have five, five quest, possible quests for each of seven factions. And my recommendation there is probably to only pick a couple of factions. And I think the factions that you probably want to pick would be Brigand Arth and um, the Grey Hands just because they're new and interesting and people haven't seen them before. And um, maybe one or two others if they, if they really fit the background of the, if they fit the background of the characters. Um, uh, I want to know who Saltmarsh changed during the conversion. Seems weird. They kept going back and repeating things now. Oh, I'm not sure what you mean for Saltmarsh. How they went back and kept uh, repeating things. What did they repeat in Saltmarsh? I don't know. I've just started reading it. Um, what was I talking about? So, yeah, pick, pick a couple of factions... And then kind of tailor the quests around what's happening in the game. So I, I really didn't run any of those. Um, I really didn't run any of those faction quests as is. I really heavily tailored them around the group that I've got. And that worked a lot better. And that, I did that both this time and when I ran it as a play test. So, uh, so chapter two is a bizarre chapter. And it's, it's a chapter where if you're a, if you're a DM that's comfortable with, um, uh, with, with kind of running your own quests and sort of going with the way the story is going, that's your chapter to do it. And it kind of d depends upon it. So uh, my friend Enrique Bertrand, the newbie DM, when he originally read Dragon Heist, felt like it was a great intro to D&D. &D. And then after he ran it, he was like, maybe not. And it, the reason he thought that was because um, he, he felt that, uh, and I agree with him, 
uh, that chapter two in particular requires a lot of work from the DM. Like his group, and he and I talked about this in a chat before. And, um, I think we talked about it on, a, on an episode of Behind the DM Screen, uh, where um, his group just didn't really, wasn't, they didn't really care about having a lair. They were kind of interested in the story. So now the nice thing is you can pretty much drop in chapter three called Fireball uh, right away. And chapter three, yeah, Power Score says chapter two is really tough for a new DM. Yeah, I, I think that's I think that's accurate. Uh, I have not talked to new DMs who've run it. So I can't really say, but I read it and I'm like, man, it feels like that's going to require a lot more work. So um, chapter three, on the other hand, is nice and straightforward again. You get a cool investigation of dealing with a fireball. There's a couple of uh, red herrings that you have to sort of handle. But generally speaking, you're uh, locating uh, the source of the fireball. You're finding about finding out about what's going on with this, uh, this family. Um, the, uh, what are they called? Oh, I forget. Uh, oh, that's not right. Oh, no, I'm screwed up. It's not the Castle Anxious, it's the other group. Terrible with names. Uh, the, where is it? Uh, Growlhund, Growlhund Villa. So Growlhund Villa is a really nice, fun place to do a, a kind of a heist, you know, sort of a break-in investigation. And the way I did it is I had Xanathar guys infiltrating the same time the characters did, and they got in a big fight, and it was really cool. Um, and it was a very dynamic situation that involved this villa. So I had a lot of fun with chapter three, and I think you can have a lot of fun. You know, again, probably better for an experienced DM who can really, uh, uh, is comfortable changing things up on the fly and sort of jumping between fighting and conversation and investigation. I threw a whole mini dungeon underneath it that was a uh, altar to uh, Asmodeus that had been previously an altar to Tiamat. I built it out in Dwarven Forge. That was pretty cool. I don't know if you can hear that. Cat has found one of her little cellophane balls. Um, we've essentially built a toy shop in here just for the cat. Oh, she's running around like crazy. It's fun. Uh, so that was a lot of fun. So last week they went down into that dungeon and they fought off more cultists. And then they found the portal. They, they found that there was a portal uh, where... Uh, um, the villain, um, Erstel Floxen, a former Zinterim assassin, had escaped. And this gets into chapter four. I'd be interested to hear what Power Score has to say about this, too. I, I, again, I haven't, I, I'm sure I read your thing, but I think I read it a while ago and I don't remember where. Um, so, chapter four is intended to be a chase. And I think that my, my again, my personal opinion um, is that if you go into a adventure or a session and say it's going to be a chase you're railroading it because it might not be a chase and an example would be the characters might decide you know what we're going to rest first we're got our asses kicked in this last fight we're going to go take a rest well that means does the chase stop like is the first stage on hold because the players are taking it or the characters are taking a rest that doesn't make any sense it means they would have gone through the whole thing right so uh, a lot of times when a part of the chase is dependent upon the characters to do something a certain way you know, that, that feels railroaded to me. So what I have preferred and what you probably saw me talk about it in the last game or the last uh, one of these shows, if you if you watched that last one, is uh, thinking of it like a trail of an investigation. So instead of there being eight steps where the uh, where the, 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 the MacGuffin, in this case, it's called the Stone of Galore, um, uh, yeah, and so Power Score brings up, and it's to me pretty pretty obnoxious that the, it assumes that you do not catch the person until the very end. And what if you know if a anybody who has any experience at all running D and D games? This is another reason why it's probably not great for new DMs. Anybody who has any experience in DMing knows that players are really creative about getting chases to stop like right off the first thing. Like I throw up a wall of stone, and like. Oh man, now what, right? Or I cast whole person on him, bang, he's done. Oh, I cast sleep. Oh, he had fewer hit points and he dropped, right? So like they can they can circumvent the thing. They can either miss the chase completely, uh, you know, like just by going somewhere else and then the chase is done. Yeah, grease, right? There's like a million ways to stop a chase. Or they're going to circumvent the chase. And those both of those circumstances feel a lot more likely than somebody actually going through with the chase as it's intended. So instead, I've been treating chapter four like it's a series of steps and we can sort of follow the stone where, so, so A, I break the chase right away. You can't, there's no chase, he's gone, he already escaped. And your job, that way the characters are like, well, I guess we can rest for a while, we can continue our investigation. 
Um, they know that there's like a hot trail they got to follow, but they know it's like not dependent on them doing it now. And the way I did that is uh, Ur- Urstel Floxen teleported away and he didn't leave behind anything that said where he went or no, no clear way to get to where he went. And the players can, or the characters can use Arcana and stuff like that to figure it out. They can, they can start to learn through visions. And, and I, and I had character that like players where their characters, you know, conducted rituals to try to say like, could we figure out where that teleport, that teleporter went? And they had visions of where it went. There's lots of ways to like give the clues about the fact that in this case, it went to the mausoleum and then they go and they travel around. They, I, I had them do some kind of cross referencing where they were able to cast Arcana checks to be like we think it was nearby and we know a general direction but we don't know exactly where and by getting around in a cart and conducting the ritual they were able to um they were able to triangulate where it went and they found that it was in a mausoleum inside the uh, city of the dead so they went there and that started the first part when they got to the city of the dead they found cultists who had um yeah, Power Score says that uh, they had problems with flipping through the book to find each section of the chase. Yeah, that's another one. It kind of jumps around a lot. Uh, I saw somebody that actually wrote the page numbers in their book to, to make the chase sequence easier, and I think that's a really good idea. Um, uh, yeah, Snark Knight said, we didn't know we needed to stay hydrated for the summer feature, so we got exhaustion. And then we said, well, we're not doing a chase while we're exhausted. That makes sense. Uh, that's pretty funny. So um, I think a new DM would have a lot of trouble with chapter four because like, what if the play, you know, this character players are not going to follow your, your, your little chain. They're going to do weird stuff and you better be prepared to handle the weird stuff. So um, I feel like this chapter could have been a better toolkit of an investigation. And that's kind of how I treat it. Uh, but it still takes a fair amount of work uh, to do that, which we'll, we'll talk about today. And the, the end result of this chapter, this is kind of the end of the adventure, right? This is sort of the end of the series because eventually they get what they need. They get the, the, the key to the vault and they can break into the vault and get it. But I think that I'm going to extend it and essentially say that, you know, the castle enters get the stone. Um, and then you have to break into the castle. Like I want to use the castle enters, right? So, you know, like if, if they get it ahead of time, it doesn't work. And, and the, the thing about the cast lanterns is they're pretty powerful. So you're not necessarily going to, you know, face off against them, but here's this whole other villa, right. And that the people, the characters can break into and their job is to get in here and find the, uh, stone of galore. And I think that them finding this, uh, finding the stone and then getting into the vault is, is more interesting and can extend this adventure out a little bit more. In fact, I'm going to, because I'm only, I told the players that we're only playing this and then the characters will be done. And then we're going to start with new characters for salt marsh. Uh, so I can level them faster. Like, you know, I think they're already fifth level or they're on their way to fifth. They're either there or getting on the way there. And I might make them sixth or seventh level. And then, you know, that they'll be higher level and have more tools to be able to break into a, a villa. That's like the, the cast lanterns. Oh, kitty. Hello. What are you doing? What you doing over there? She finds like a rubber band. She found a rubber band and it was the best thing in the world, but I had to take it away from her. Now she's found a piece of string and a plastic bag. And you think like a piece of string and a plastic bag are probably not the best toys for a little kitten. So more things I'll have to take away. Um, the nice thing is she just sleeps when we're gone. She really only plays when we're here, it seems. We, we know this because we can peek into our own window and see her from inside the window. Uh, yeah, so when I look at... Let's jump over to uh, my game notes. Uh, so this is these are my new game notes, but I kept some of my notes from the other ones. So t- today I have an interesting thing, and this is, this is um, you know, a common... I think a common situation... Uh, which is, I only have, it's Memorial Day weekend, and two of my five regular players are out, and my two on-call players both can't make it. So I have uh, three players today, uh, which could be pretty interesting, right? And um, are you going to do the Day of the Damned Party at the Castle Interim? That might be a good idea. I need to read up on it, right? I need, I, I, but I think that that would be a good idea. I'd love to have like an event. And they know that there's this event taking place, and it's happening at the same. The Day of the Damned is when they're going to kill everybody in the place, right? And I don't, I don't think I'm necessarily going to run that because I actually have an interesting way I want to run the Castle Lanterns, which is their goal is to save their children, right? Their goal isn't necessarily to, um, you know, they, they are these Asmodeus cultists, 
but they lost one of their children as they bought their thing and then realized that that price was too high. And now they're trying to get back the, um, they're trying to get back uh, the half a million gold dragons so they can pay back the half of their contract for Asmodeus and, and get the souls of their children back. And that way there's an interesting, you know, there, there's going to be an interesting pressure on uh, the characters on what do they do, you know, what do they do with the money? Uh, which I'm, I, I don't know how that's going to go. I don't even know how exactly how I'm going to set that up. But what I don't want to do is have the Castle Enders be mass murderers because that's just too easy to make them villains. And I think it's more interesting if they are kind of villains and they probably did some bad stuff. They certainly have killed people, but their motivation isn't like to get rich and gain power or it was originally, but now it's can they, um, uh, you know, can they, uh, can they get back the souls of their children, which I think is pretty interesting. What are you doing, kitty? What are you doing over there? She's so distracting. Um, yeah, so I think the idea that they might, like, maybe they're setting up a party and they're running this party. And maybe there's other villains that are there who are like, we're going to kill everybody here. And that way it's not necessarily the Castle Lanterns, but the Castle Lanterns have that kind of thing going on uh, at the same time as everything else. So that we can make, like, a really nice complicated situation. But the end result is the, the, the Stone of Galore is probably going to head to the Castle Lanterns. Now, I don't want to presuppose this. Like, maybe the characters figure out a way to get it ahead of time. Um, but I don't think they're going to figure out. There, there she is. There's the kitty. Everybody say hello. She doesn't know that she's on the YouTube and on the Twitch. Oh, there she goes. Maybe she does know. She likes that hamper a lot. Uh... Zardoz Zord could be at the part could be a party guest. Yeah, that'd be kind of funny, right? Jarlaxel messing with everyone's plans. Jar Jarlaxel's there to try to pick up the Stone of Glory as well. And maybe uh, they invite uh, Blackstaff, right? And she shows up to the party, you know, and like everyone's there. It could be this really kind of fun event where like all the major players are there. Be like, we have like a master assassin and and a and a couple of Asmodian Asmodius mages and and also here's Blackstaff. And oh, is that is that the open Lord of Waterdeep walking in? You know, <laughs> like, oh my God, everyone's here. That might be a little much, but it could be interesting. Um, do you have your, your foil ball? Uh, yeah, and the drow sneaking around the rooftop. So there, there's a lot of things here. So, um, but today let's look at the steps. Uh, so we're gonna go over here. I'm gonna go to hell of a summer. Sorry, wrong one. Uh, we're going to go to Dragon Season. And in Dragon Season, I don't know if you can hear it. Can you hear her rap running around with her foil thing? Is that picking up on the mic? I bet it's picking up on the mic. It's pretty loud. So these are, uh, and we are in summer. So we're the second row from the left. Mausoleum, Converted Windmill, Rooftop Jace. Um, a thrumming sound erupts from the gaping maw in the yawning portal in and shakes the mountainside. That's that's some good fiction. I wonder what's coming up. An angry bestial titan. Uh, so we already caught a couple of steps, which is we I know in the previous game they got to the mausoleum and found dead cultists there who had betrayed them. Uh, the the betrayed cultists went to the converted windmill and then they were slaughtered by um they were slaughtered by um uh spine devils so the start the start to today's adventure is going to be um spine devils um it'd be nice if i could do a cool dwarven forge setup for this uh, maybe i'll try to do something like that um so Spine Devils at the Windmill, and there were probably three Spine Devils. They were summoned by the Castle Anters, probably by um, the uh, uh, the husband, who is the more powerful of the two. Um, he probably summoned up some and said, get that stone. And the, 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 the stone cannot be scried, so he doesn't know where it is, but the Spine Devils could have been following the cultists. And when they saw that there was betrayal, the Spine Devils who were there to kind of make sure that the that the... Yeah, and this here's a secret, right? We're gonna add. I already have some old secrets, but we'll make some new secrets. Uh, um, Castle Andrew summoned the Spine Devils to watch her still flocks in and make sure. 
make sure that the stone got to uh, the, their villa. Um, so two spine devils stuck around. Uh, Uh, and one took the stone to um, to the Castle Antervelad, who's on a coach. That's really, that's a secret. Doesn't matter too much, but you know what I mean. Um, so, and we don't really have to follow this too much, right? But... Uh, the coach was waylaid. Uh, it, it, it hit like a, a uh, and, and they think that this will be an investigation um, that they find. Um, so how do they find it? Uh, They'll have to find, and um, someone will have to know. Uh, you got your asses kicked at the coach fight. Is there a coach fight? Is only, what, what, what? I mean, obviously there is. If you said there is, uh, but let me. What one is that? Uh, mausoleum, windmill, rooftop chase. Is that alley and street chase? Uh, an alley and street chase are encounter one and three. Oh man, my, my normal routine for using a one to find a thing is not working. Uh, you're right about this. Here we go. Let's go to one. Oof. Man, this alley, huh? Uh, so encounter one is the alley. And we go to, the alley has a bunch of things. Residences and stores. It's got a nice map. That's kind of cool. Um, and summer, uh, hire coach. Uh, parked in the middle of the alley is a hire coach and drew draft horses. Driver, uh, the, uh, Lord Castle enters doppelganger valet, Williford Crowley. Uh, let me grab that name. Uh, Castle Hunter Valet, Wilfred Crowley. And we will stick him down in our NPCs. He's a good guy to keep track of. Um, uh, he has the Stone of Galore. So he drives her way in the coach. This is what I mean by like the chase, right? Uh, Sarah Dirthands, yeah. She's the, Sarah Dirthands is an agent of Jarlaxle. Um, she's a young girl who keeps track of the characters and she's the one that always gets their coaches for him. She's like their version of Uber. But she's also reporting to Jarlaxle, and they kind of know it too. Who isn't an agent of Jarlaxle? It's a very good point. So in this one, you're supposed to go and fight him and stuff. Um, uh, and then it goes to the street chase. And the street chase, characters pursue gasoline uh, as he flees on a, on a higher court on foot. Chase takes place in crowded streets. Um so changing this up because it's an investigation um if the characters did not show up so we have a couple of like hooks right the spine devil takes the thing to the coach and we have probably two people at the coach williford Crowl crowley and his um i like the idea that he's got a bar bearded devil um Um, 
Yeah, big thick bearded guy, and it turns out he's actually a bearded devil. And maybe he's um uh so if the characters didn't get involved, then the spine devil would drop it off with him, he would get it, and he would ride back to the castle entrance with the stone. But something happened along the way, and that is that uh three street urchins uh set up a trap and crashed the uh, carriage and took the stone. Uh, Erstel um, Erstel finds the kid, uh, goes to the, finds his kids. He wounds one of them. And leads to the castle lanterns. And that's how the stone gets to the castle lanterns. So I think that's the whole... I'm going to dump this whole thing here. Um, I think it's the same thing. I think I just wrote out the exact same stuff. Um... So, yeah, so if the characters didn't get involved at all, this is what would have happened. Um, and we don't have to worry about the stuff that happened before. So basically, Erstel had the stone. He teleported to the mausoleum where he met up with the cultist. He gave it over to one of the cultists who was supposed to take it straight to um, Crowley at the guard. They were just going to mix things up so that, you know, it was already too hot and he didn't want to make sure that people was on him. So, so Erstel didn't do it himself because he didn't want to have eyes on him. Uh, and then he took off the, the, um, cultists betrayed each other. Two of them murdered the other two. They went to the windmill to go move this, move the stone, probably maybe sell it to the, to the Xanathar guild. Um, but they were attacked by beer, barbed devils. The barbed devils were sent by the castle lanterns to make sure everything went smooth. And when it didn't, they killed the two cultists. One of them took the stone. The other two, uh, hung around to see if they could find out who they were trying to sell it to. Um, the spine devil brought the stone to um, his other devil partner to whom they, that he worked for, uh, which is the guard of um, Williford. I know this is complicated, but this is kind of the fun of the, you know, it's complicated and the complications are the fun part. Um, Williford, so the stone goes back to the guard. Williford takes it. He's like, great. He goes into his coach. Everything's fine. They're riding back when bang, the, 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 they fall into a ditch with a piece of canvas over the top of it. And it wrecks the car, cracks the axle. They are both thrown forward. Everything crashes forward. He loses the stone. And a young tiefling girl darts in, grabs the stone. They grab a bag of money and they leave. And they go run down into the cellars. Um, the two guys are trying to get up uh, out of it when Erstel Floxen shows up again and he's like, are you effing kidding me? We lost it again, right? He's uh, enthralled. He's like, never mind. I'll kill those kids. I'll get the thing and I'll bring it back to the castle lanterns myself. You guys are a bunch of numbskulls. And he goes down into the cellars. He, um, uh, he stabs one of the kids. He takes the stone and he leaves to go to the castle lanterns. And uh, then and he makes it there with the stone, takes it to the castle lanterns. Uh, however, that brings heat on the castle lanterns because you have this ex interim assassin who just showed up at the castle lanterns place with a piece of stolen goods. Oh, I I don't kitty. What? What's the matter? Oh, there you go. Think. Hello, hello there, flopper. Hello. She's so cute. So um, it's really complicated, but that's the way that it would happen. So what, what happens when the party goes there? Well, the party's going to figure out all of this stuff. The hard part is, um, uh, yeah, the shift botches are watching the pit bosses. The casino managers is watching the shift botches. And the eye in the sky watches everybody 
<laughs> good line from Casino. Um, I recognize your reference. Uh, hello, where's a kitty? How are you? How are you, girl? Oh, there she goes. Um, so, uh, it's complicated. So the, I guess one trick is like when they're fighting the spine devils, how do they find out that the spine devils are bringing it to the coach? And I guess one way I could do it, this gets into the characters. This is one possible option, but there could be others, which is that, um, our fiendish, um, our, uh, uh, our fiendish warlock now has a rod of the pact keeper. And that Rod can tell him, hey, I know where those devils went. And he can follow it. And he finds, like, there's not just one. There's two, and one's more powerful than the other. And that's when he shows up at the coach. And the two guys are at the coach waiting for Erstel to come back. And Erstel doesn't come back. He's, he's, he's gone. So they're, they're catching up rel relatively quickly um, on, on everything that's going on. So it's a little chase-like. It's just they're sort of one step ahead. Does that, does that you know? So I think that that will work. And I think that that might be most of today. And then at the sort of the end is that the castle anters have uh, have the stone. They could have skipped all this and just gone straight to the castle anters and have figured that they have the stone. Um, so it's a little a little bit of a roundy, you know, big round robin thing. Um, uh, yeah. So we will. So we will see. Um, and I think, but I think that that, you know, to me, a more, I think this gets into a larger, a larger topic, which is, um, and I've, I've been thinking about this more and more. I can't remember where I was, I was thinking about this in, in regards to something else too. The idea, and I, I, I hang on to it all the time and I talk about it a lot, which is like building a situation rather than, than, uh, an expectation of an outline of scenes. And the idea is like the Castle Anter Villa, like we say, Here's the Castle Lantern Villa. Here's what's going on in the Castle Lantern Villa. There's a big party going on at the Castle Lantern Villa. The Castle Lanterns have the Stone of Galore. The main guy locked it up in his study upstairs. By the way, there's a devil that's locked up there who was their first son who was taken and their soul was removed. The other two kids are hanging out there. They have some, you know, they have members of their staff who are loyal fanatics of their cult. Um, and maybe they have uh, somebody else who thinks that they've gone weak and wants to take over. And that person's like, I'm going to kill everybody in this place. So you sort of set the stage of what's going on in this place. And you have a big map of the place, right? We have the Castle Lantern Villa. Where is it? So you have a big map of the place that you can sort of fill out with all this stuff. And you, you sort of, you know, kind of outline that out and have it handy. And then you put it in front of the characters and see how they react. We don't know what they're going to do. We don't know if they're going to break in. We don't know if they're going to try to sneak in or pretend that they're members of the staff. We don't know if they're just going to kick in the front door and start stabbing people. You know, you, you kind of want to make sure that there's options for a mix of all of the archetypes of all of the three pillars. But in general, you, you want to set the stage for the situation and let the characters uh, navigate it. And uh, with this chase, it's a little bit of the same that we 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 obviously we want to focus the game on the characters. They're the heroes of the story. But one of the ways to make that story interesting is to say, what would this situation be like if the characters never got involved? Right. What would it be like anyway? And if we know if we can answer that question, if we could say, like, you know, if if they stole the stone of galore and like if you imagine from the time the gnome is walking up to troll skull with the stone from the moment the fireball goes off to the moment the stone enters the hand of of, you know, Mr. Castlanter. I don't know what his name is. Let's go to uh, let's go find out. Oh, God, I keep going on the wrong thing. Um, Victorio, right? From the time it leaves the hand of the gnome to the time it enters the hand of Victorio Castellanter, what path did it take? And how would that go when the characters aren't involved? And then we see how the characters get involved and we see how that situation changes and reacts to the way the characters are interacting with it. And that's a very different way than we might think of. I think it's, it's you know, uh, and it sounds a little egotistical to say it's kind of, you know, it's sort of the advanced way to think about a D&D &D game. 
Uh, it's it's a it's a very different shift in how we think about D and D that we don't think of it as a series of scenes that we outline. We don't see it as a series of a string of encounters that take place. We think about the the holistic picture of what's going on, and then kind of make sure that that is solid and sort of work it into our minds and and use maps and then give clues to the characters about what's going on and then see how it works. Now, one trick with that is that you know. Unless your players are really well coordinated, uh, they're going to make some pretty big mistakes. And I, you know, I have three different D and D groups um, that that I play, and they're all wonderful, super smart people. But when you know we're all sitting and playing a game, and we all have different things going on in our lives, and sometimes we miss a piece of evidence, we miss miss something, and you don't want to punish them for not being super strategically sound. And instead, so it's okay for them to make mistakes and have those mistakes not completely destroy the event you know sometimes you can do it by just saying are are you really sure you want to you know kick in that door with your sword drawn that might get attention here you can give some nice hints like oh i didn't understand exactly how the situation works um you know i i ran a game yesterday i ran my princes of the apocalypse game and uh a key piece of information about where the final boss was kind of got lost and uh, one player thought that we had gone through a door that was obviously the right door, while the other people said, no, we don't want to go through that door. And he thought we had gone through that door. So he thought we already went to the place where he was thought it was most likely to find the guy, and it turned out it wasn't. And it was just because we, I, I, you know, he, I, I said it wrong, and he didn't pick it up right. And the other players made a decision that was different than his, and he didn't really know that that had happened. So, and then, you know, and again, these are, everybody in that room yesterday has been playing D&D. Well, Four of the six of us that were in that room have been playing together for like a grand total of three, six, nine, 12, 120 years worth of D&D time. And we still had a mistake like that, right? So, you know, each of us have been playing for roughly 30 years. Uh, and then we had two other people that are both pretty familiar with D&D, but playing, they, they haven't played quite as long. And frankly, we're no worse than the rest of us when it came to kind of these miscommunications. Miscommunication is probably a big deal at a D&D game. The other trick was, and I really wish I had done this. So one of my characters, one of my players in that game uh, is blind. So I, I try not to use visuals pretty much at all. Um, but in that case, it would have been handy if I had just drawn a stick figure map because it was, I'll show it to you. Um, uh, it was from Princes of the Apocalypse. Princes of the Apocalypse. And it was the um, Fane of the Eye. And one of the things about the Fane of the Eye, let's open this in a new tab, is that every room in this place, almost every room, has three to four connections. Um, yeah, Kitty's hanging out. How are you doing up there? I don't give you with your with your pretty eyes. So we 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 had come to naming her Maliki. So she's going to be named Maliki. Uh, the non trademark version of Maliki is that it's a Finnish a Finnish goddess of nature. Uh, it also happens to be the goddess of nature and uh, uh, and and nice things in the Forgotten Realms. So that's what we decided upon. Yeah. So this this map, if you look at it, like the number of interconnections of places, especially in the rooms in the middle. Like I, I, I brought up this center room, the one that has like the weird idol in it. Uh, and this room alone uh, has five passageways that lead in and out of it, right? So it was like you enter a room with a crazy weird altar in the center. You know, I didn't I describe it better than that. But, you know, big, big crazy altar in the center, altar to the uh, god of oozes. There is a door to the there – are, there are passageways leading to the southwest – um, or, or there's a passageway leading to the west, the south, the southeast, the northeast, and north. Which one do you want to go? And you're like, five ways? You know, are you kidding? And I think it, it wasn't this room. Yeah, it was this room where I said, by the way, the south, the southwest passageway is blocked with dead fire cultists, a couple of dead earth cultists, and a few fire cultists that have clearly been petrified. And they were like, and then half the party's like, well, we're not going that way. And the other half is like, I bet that's where the boss is, right? And they decided, no, let's go the other way. So they went all the way up north and they went all through this. And at one point, like they entered this place and I was like, there are three exits, but you have been to the rooms of all three. And they're like, oh, so this is going back. But it's like every one of these rooms is like, they're so interconnected. 
like every one of these rooms has like three passageways, right? You go here and this has got three passageways. They all, the average is like three passageways, right? On all of these chambers. Uh, when the, this is where they needed to go. This is what we're going to play next time. Um, so really confusing to describe that just vocally. And if I had just drawn little circles with lines that connected and I said, this is this, and you, know, you, you could draw this whole map with just circles and lines that interconnect them. And, and, you know, that would have helped every player except the player who can't see. And she would pick, she would be able to pick up generally what's going on um, from everybody else. But that, that it didn't occur to me that sort of like these mapping a complicated environment like this um, is sort of like having a visual puzzle. And if you don't have a visual, it's really hard to do. The other thing is that the players could have mapped it themselves. Like if I, and if I had mentioned to him, like this, this is, you're, you're in a pretty complicated place. You probably want to draw a map. It doesn't have to be perfect squares, but just generally speaking, you probably want to keep track of where you are and where you've been and, and I'll help you fill it out, you know? And, and I wish I had done that, but I didn't. So there, we're all learning. Uh, what else? So I think I've got a pretty straightforward game for today. Um, I don't really have any treasure that I'm going to give out. The strong start is they're fighting spine devils at the windmill. I'm going to bring my Dwarven Forge set, and I'll bring some spine devil minis. There's only three players, so I'm only going to have two spine devils. Uh, how hard are spine devils? Uh, spine devils are... Challenge two. So yeah, uh, that means they're roughly the equivalent of level fives. I bet you. Yeah, so two of these guys are going to be pretty hard. They're only 22 hit points, though. So I don't know. They might not be so bad. We'll see. But with only three players, um, it could be tricky. Uh, maybe another one will attack. I don't know. Let's use the encounter builder. Tools. Encounter builder. I have... Let's close that. Manage characters. I have three level five characters uh and i'm gonna add spine spine devil and i'm gonna drag that over and we're gonna have no don't no stay that is easy three is hard so we'll probably i don't know because they might have that other fight too um windmill save and then let's create a new one and we'll say carriage i can't spell carriage hey look i spelled carriage uh and the that one might have a spine devil and a bearded oh there's a right there uh and that looks like it's uh for three characters bearded devils are challenge threes um, so this says that according to, is that right? Even with that number of characters, I guess it's right. Um, bearded devils, I thought bearded devils are pretty tough. You have 52 hit points. Uh, so we've got my encounter. So I no longer, let's see. That's, this is a this is a bug that it really wants this wide view. Sorry, I probably just screwed up the window really badly, didn't I? Uh, it wants this really wide view, and it can't show you. Like, the names don't fit. Like, I don't care when I made it. I care about what I've got. So we're going to delete that. I don't need that one anymore. And we're going to delete this one. And now I've got my two encounters in my. Uh, so now I can load this up on my phone and I've got the encounters all set and ready to go. Uh, do the three characters have range attacks? Yes. Um, they might have a time, hard time with flying monsters. Uh, one of them is a uh, Pact of the Fiend Warlock. So he's got lots of good uh, encounters. Um, I think that some of them, so it's going to be a cleric and a uh, warlock. And who's the other guy? Um, and a bard. So I think between the cleric, the warlock, and the bard, and the bard can fly himself. So they, they, they'll be okay. They'll be fine. Um, kind of interesting to play with the encounter builder. I don't know, you know, it's not really my thing, I guess. 
Um, it's kind of handy. And I think I talked about this last time. The problem when you have like this thing that does all this complicated math for you is um, the math is off, period. Like even if it's on, it's off. So relying on this math too much is going to um, be frustrating. So it's better to have like a loose idea in your head of like, you know, a challenge two monster is, you know, like, you know, I figured that like two would be about right. And I think it's about right. You know, three would probably be hard. So um, it's harder at level five. Above Five and above is pretty easy because a challenge, the creature's challenge rating is roughly equivalent of half of the character's level. So if you have a challenge 10 creature, it's the equivalent of a single level 20 character. Um, so that works. Uh, I think in uh, the Lazy DM's workbook, I have a nice... I had it memorized and then I stopped. So I don't know, but let's take a look over here. Uh, Lazy DM workbook. And let's jump over to this. Uh, bang, bang, bang. And in here we have encounter building, little encounter building thing. Yeah, here we go. So for second to fourth level characters, they're fifth. So if they're fifth, then I don't have to worry about it. Yeah. And it's, if the challenge rating is one tenth of their level, it's four monsters per character. If it's a quarter of their level, it's two monsters per character. If it's half their level, it's one monster per character. So a um, two spine devils is about right for uh, three level five characters. It's a little bit more than one per. One monster per two characters is three quarters of their level. So that like a, a third and a fourth. So if you think about it like this, this the math here and the math of um, the encounter builder, they're pretty close. Uh, mine just, you know, fits onto an index card. And I really want to like memorize it. The problem is like CR and, and level just don't fit very well together. And it's really hard to sort of figure that out. Um, and seeing how other game systems do it recently. Like I, I looked at Shadow of the Demon Lord and I looked at 13th Age and none of them have a great way. Fourth edition was pretty solid, but the, the, the only reason why fourth works so well is because if the math increased so fast. You could get away with having like levels of monsters and levels of characters fitting together, but you can't quite do that now. So let's see. So we got about 10 minutes left. What would we like to talk about now? Do we want to talk about, um, we could talk about, uh, we can talk about the kitty. Oh, there she is sleeping. Hello, sleepy kitty. She's having a fun run around. Um, Ghost of Saltmarsh. All right. He's not your problem. Wants to talk about Ghost of Saltmarsh. Let's talk about Ghost of Saltmarsh. Let's pull up Ghost of Saltmarsh. Uh, sources. Adventures. So I'll be picking up my hardcover version today. I am also getting the Beetle and Grimm version today. Um, here's the awesome cover art. Uh, can I open that up in a... There you go. Isn't that cool looking? Oh, so uh, he's not your problem. Ran the adventure. I have a question for you then. He's not your problem. Uh, I am going to, yeah. So Power Score asked me, am I going to run all of the Salt Marsh Adventures linked together? I am. I'm going to try to run it together. I mean, unless I read something and it, like, I don't know how it runs. Um, then I, I plan to, uh, uh, by the way, I don't think that's a Kraken in the back. I think that's a giant octopus, if I recall. Spoilers. Mind you, we're going to be talking salt marsh spoilers. So if you are playing salt marsh, you're going to get spoiled. But I think that's a giant octopus, not a kraken. Um, and there's a difference. So uh, I I plan to run them together, and I I I'm kind of all in because I ordered the Beetle and Grim box set for it, and I'm planning to run it for both groups. And I think it'll be nice because I really like the idea of a nice, fun seafaring adventure. I like the idea. It's in Greyhawk. Uh, levels of salt marsh is uh, level one to eleven, I think, maybe up to one to thirteen. Uh, by the end, uh, let's go to the intro and take a look. Look at that. Isn't that great? There's like a fish person with an otter. I love it. Uh, I don't think the Beetle and Grim sets have, be have shipped yet. I think it's June before they show up, which is fine because I've got to, um, uh, you know, I've got to finish the stuff I've got. Uh, uh, I'm looking for a level range. Is the back text on there? I think it's like one to 13. Uh, it's somewhere thereabout. Um, and it has, so some of these adventures are shorter and some are longer. Um, Sinister Secret Assault Marsh is the first one. That is a kind of a two-parter and it, it, it kind of gets you to two levels. Uh, like, you know, and I recommend it. It says one to 12 on the back. Power score says one to 12. Um, 
That makes sense. And I'm going to level my characters up quickly. So it's going to be like one encounter in and they'll level to two because I hate running at level one. And, you know, yeah. Uh, so uh, he's not your problem, ran Sinister Secret with third level characters. So uh, one question I have, and one thing that wasn't really clear to me, the hooks for the first adventure. So again, uh, warning, we're going to have spoilers for Secret of Salt Marsh here. Um, but the hooks for the first one didn't seem real deep. Like, it's kind of like there's this crazy haunted house and nobody from Salt Marsh will go near the place. And the last person that went there said they got screamed at and fled, you know, and they're all like, oh yeah. And, and there's a, I like the idea that like you're walking to the house and like a bunch of the villagers are walking with you and then they see it and like, well, gotta go. And they all turn around and leave. That's funny, but it's not a strong hook for the characters. Like, why would I go to a haunted house, right? Like there's nothing there. There's a couple of hooks that they mention in the adventure. Um, great art. Look at that art, right? Oh my God. Uh, and there's one other thing I want to talk about this that I absolutely just fell in love with. Uh, but yeah, Volo gives him the deed. <laughs> hey, you get a free house. Uh, so the hooks, you know, there are like, well, there's a hidden hoard, but there isn't really a hidden hoard there. I guess there is, but the one that could be that there's a very valuable relic. And somebody could be, you know, you could have sort of a crazy person who's like, I'd really love it if you could find, um, there's a stone, there's an alchemist stone in there and I'd like you to go find the alchemist stone. So that could be, that could be cool. Um, the other one is there's a dead knight in here and it might be cool to have like the lover of the dead knight say, Hey, my, 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 my true love went there trying to get rich and never came out again. And I, I know they're dead, but I just want to have something here of what they, and I don't want them to be undead. So could you go there and clean it? That might be a nice heart tugger, heart tugging way to, to get the characters to go there. But it wasn't super, it just, it, it felt like, you know, all of the reasons to not go were pretty strong reasons. Uh, he's not your problem. Says the hook that I created was the players uh, are by the docks in the morning when all the fishing ships come in. The last arrive has three bodies in the point where the house is. So the galleon, um, so the Gellin Primewater, the town councilman who is himself a smuggler, oh, spoilers, offers to pay them uh, if they can clear out the house or whatever lurks inside. Um, except if they're the smugglers and the smugglers own the house, right? The, the, the problem is like the whole smuggling group doesn't want the characters to show up there. In fact, there's a character in the place that's like tries to get the characters to leave. So it's like, if those works, if those things work, the characters are going to leave and then you're kind of stuck. <laughs> so it's like, well, you're supposed to figure your way out. So yeah, it, it looked a little tricky. I mean, it's not bad and it's a nice solid adventure. It's a nice clean thing. I love the haunted house stuff. It's, you know, it's the secret. It's not really a haunted house. Um, so it looks pretty cool, but it, but it has a few things where it's like they, it, you know, it has to land right. Um, uh, and if it doesn't land right, if the characters don't sort of figure it out, it's sort of the adventure sort of stalls. Uh, and that's the case with this one. The, it's also the case with the next of the three U series adventures. Um, and again, I only skim. I read the first half of the first adventure pretty thoroughly at this point. Uh, is Danger at Dunwater is the Lizard Folk one, right? So the Lizard Folk one is another one where the main purpose of this adventure is to figure out that the Lizard Folk are actually about to go to war with the with the um, Sahuagin. And, um, you can, uh, you know, if things go south with this, you will end up, uh, kind of missing the whole point of this adventure. So, you know, it's, it's, it's one where you need the players to figure out, you want the players to figure out the truth, but you don't want to beat them over the head with it and you don't want them to miss it either. So it's this real tight reign of like, make sure they figure it out, but don't give them too much hints. Uh, which is a whole secret thing. And it, and also, I think there's something in here. They have a good point of like, if you guys got a bunch of people that want to kill stuff, here's some things where you can that you can kill in this adventure because a lot of it is negotiating with, with lizard folk. Um, so it's pretty good. One overall thought that I had about this, I was talking to my wife about it on our, on our walk today, um, is unlike other hardback adventures that we've had, like um, so not so much with Dragon Heist, but with... Tomb of Annihilation and Storm King's Thunder and uh, Curse of Strahd and, and the other ones is there's no real sandbox in this. It's a linear series of adventures that take you from level one to level 11 or level 12. Um, and you kind of run one, each one at a time and each one is sort of self-contained. And there's a little bit of like the Sahuagin battle, uh, you know, kind of permeates and you can throw your own hooks through it like the smugglers. And then there's a whole other faction in here. Um, that has their sort of thing going on where they want to take over. And there's a lot of interesting politics. I sort of like the idea that there's all this like 
Greyhawk politics going on, but all the politics is happening kind of on the outside, but it's all sort of permeating here. And I think like, to me, this, you know, everything reminds me of the show Deadwood. And in Deadwood, um, you have this like out, you know, this outcast town that doesn't have any laws, but it's rich. And yet there's all these politics at play of like, are they going to become part of the Dakotas? And are they, you know, what is the, what is, what do those bureaucrats in Washington think? And what happens when the rich people disappear? And we don't want to have a sheriff here. Or do, is it better if we have a sheriff so that we aren't circumvented by other people? There's a lot of this sort of politics, this sort of, you know, coastal sort of out, outland politics going on that has a real interesting effect on uh, the game. Uh, there's one more part that I want to talk about that I just fell in love with. And I mentioned this on Twitter and I wrote a whole article about this idea. And that's um, the idea of single paragraph adventures and single paragraph campaigns. And um, yeah, he's not your problem, hit it on the head. Uh, I think they, they built the first chapter interesting hooks with Dreadwood. And so the section of Dreadwood in here, uh, they talk a lot about Dreadwood apparently. So the Dreadwood, uh, let's kill that. Um, the Dreadwood, there's just one section on this, right? And it's this wood, but the wood is a is sitting on the edge of the Shadowfell. And Granny Nightshade is an ancient night hag who has all of the powers of the mightiest wizard, i.e. she's not just the stat block for a night hag, but maybe a night hag and an archmage mixed together. Um, uh, he's not your problem, hit it down, uh, head on the, uh, got ahead of me again. Uh, which is, you know, you have a night hag who has three vampire cohorts, right? Uh, she has a bunch of green hags as, that act as her baronesses. She's got jack wares as her foremost minions. I love this. She has 23 oni that act as her personal messengers and enforcers, right? Not, not a million oni, but 23 oni. Um, so she's got these, you know, ogre mages that are her personal, like, liaisons, right? And... You know, like this paragraph, these, there's your two paragraphs of text right here, right? That's your level 12 to level 20 campaign, right? You could do the whole rest of a 20 level campaign in these two paragraphs. And I love that. I love this. It's so rich. I, I'd like to know who wrote it and, and, and give them a big thumbs up because they just packed so much other cool stuff on here. Uh, it sounds like Mike Merle's wrote it. Well, Mike Merle's nailed it because... Two paragraphs of text that really, I mean, it's actually a little bit more because you have the, the, the Granny Night Hag and her stuff, Castle Spiral, which is where she is, the whole idea that there's this like planar, you know, this planar uh, um, weakening between the Shadowfell and Earth. So you get that extra planar thing. And it's in that forest right over there to the east. So you can build this 20 level campaign just with this section on the Dreadwood. I'm, I'm fascinated by it. I don't know if I'm going to run it because I, you know, I got other things to run. And now we got two other campaigns, three other adventures coming out this year. Oh my God, I don't have too many adventures to run. Um, but boy, it, it, it fascinates me. And I, I want to make more stuff like this. I want to, and I got plans. I got plans to do more stuff like this. So you're going to see more like 20 level campaigns and three paragraphs of text. Um, Starter set, Descent into Avernus, uh, Shark Facer. I'm, I'm including uh, Salt Marsh, right? So yeah, not three. Three more, three including this one that came out this year because I'm still not done with the ones I'm running. What's funny is like I run a lot of D&D games. I run two weekly games, right? And three hours a week per game. And I can't keep up. You know, it's amazing. So much stuff, much less any of the other third-party stuff. Uh, uh, Tales of the Old Margrave came out right? And I can't play that. All right. Not that I can't play that. I'll have to find a time when I play it. But boy, if all of a sudden this hobby just fell on its face and nobody made anything more, I'd still have like five years worth of stuff to run, not to mention my own stuff. Uh, I thought it was also interesting, uh, and, and, and he's not your problem, could pick this up too, that if you look at who shows up when you go to the outer fringe, the middle reaches, and the dreaded deeps, that you know, you have 4d6 skeletons, 3d10 zombies, 3d4 ghouls, 2d6 specters, 2d4 whites, 1d6 vampire spawns, 1d6 wraiths, 2d6 mummies, 2d6 shadows, 1d3 vampires, 1d3 night hags, 1d4 oni, an adult green dragon, or a death knight. Like, these are powerful freaking encounters. So, you know, yeah, that's, that's why it gets to this whole, like, you know, 
this whole area is easily could could take you all the way to 20. And I just I, I'm fascinated. They they should have mentioned something like these these you know this whole thing it, when a DM fills it out could take you from one to 20. You know I think they're underselling what they have here. Um, and that and that doesn't get in all the other stuff that's here. So I I really think it's fascinating that they have sort of all this stuff. Um, and there is a section here I probably need to read again after I read the adventures, which is um, how to run you know, how to tie these adventures together. This sort of has a whole section here on how to tie these adventures together. It even has stuff on how to tie in the yawning portal, which I thought was kind of cool. Um, so I really, my, my first reading of this uh, is is pretty solid. I think it's really great. I'm happy to get the, Be- the Beetle and Grimm set. I want to read all of the adventures first, and I want to kind of read all, at least read all of the summaries, not necessarily all of the descriptions of places, but at least get through all of the summaries so that I can sort of tie them together into a bigger campaign. Um, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to miss out on being able to foreshadow. There isn't the the advantage of reading. If you're going to run something like this, the advantage of reading the whole thing through, uh, is that you can plant all sorts of seeds early on that sort of tie to things that happen later. And it makes everything feel tighter, uh, when you do it that way, The, the players notice when it's like, oh yeah, it was that whole thing. Yeah. The thing happened yesterday. We're like, oh, I had that vision of the guy that had like the, the snake heads, Right, he had snake hair, and you know, I bet he's a Medusa, and I bet that's this guy, Marlos Erlen Ray, you know, and or er, er, um, er, er, yeah, Erin Erin Lay or something like that. I can't remember. Um, so you want to be able to plant seeds like that early on, which means it's worth the time to read uh, an entire adventure through. Plus, it's just fun. It's just you know, that's the lonely fun of D and D. When you can't play D and D, pick up a book and read it. Um. Anyway, it is 11.07. I have to uh, get ready to go. Uh, we have f- officially exhausted the cat. Yeah. Hello, Maliki. You sleeping? Sleeping and purring. Uh, I want to thank everybody for hanging out and chat today. Really fun to have you guys uh, uh, to talk to. Um, I want to thank my mom for coming. Thank you, mom. Uh, I want to thank my kitty uh, for, for co-hosting the show with me. Um, And I will see all of you guys next week. So have a great week and go and play some D&D.